Uh, thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the events here, hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events um, by visiting our website at pals.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Tonight, we are so happy to welcome Morgan Thomas in conversation with Kristen Arnett, talking about Morgan's new book, Manywhere. Morgan Thomas's work has appeared in The Atlantic, American Short Fiction, Vice, Electric Literature, Them, and Story Quarterly, where their story won the 2019 Fiction Prize. The nine stories in Morgan Thomas's debut collection, Manywhere, witness Southern queer and gender queer characters determined to find themselves reflected in the pages of history at whatever cost. As each character traces deceit and violence through Southern tall tales and their own past, their journeys reveal the porous boundaries of body, land, and history, and the sometimes ruthless awakenings of self-discovery. Thomas will be joined in conversation by queer fiction and essay writer Kristen Arnett, author of With Teeth and the New York Times bestselling debut novel, Mostly Dead Things, which was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award in Fiction. Uh, this evening's event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Lastly, support Morgan and Powell's by purchasing a copy of their book from us. A link to buy Manywhere will be shared in the chat a couple times tonight, along with links to Kristen's books as well. All right, Morgan and Kristen, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to start with a short reading, but before I read, I just want to say thank you to Powell's for hosting Kristen and me this evening. Um, it's been, Powell's has been such a wonderful source of writing community for me uh, when living in Portland. And thank you also to Kristen. I've admired your work from afar for many years, so it's an incredible joy and honor to be in conversation with you this evening. Um, and then last, thank you to everyone who has come to listen. The love in the chat um, is really buoying and is also helping my nerves. So I very much appreciate all of you. Um, and I'm gonna read for just a few minutes from the beginning of the book. So this is the beginning of the story, Taylor Johnson's Lightning Man. October, 2008. I'm here in the photo booth on Ellis Island waiting for you, Lightning Man. You're sailing from London on the ocean liner, New York. Your ship docks in one hour, 100 years ago. We'll miss each other by a century, I know. It doesn't matter to me. I'm here anyway, waiting. I have something to tell you. After you disembark, follow signs to the gift shop. I'm on the first floor near the water fountains, past the ladies, make a right at the elevator. The medical ward where you spent most of your time on the island is closed to visitors now. The room where you argued your case before the board of special inquiry is locked, visible only through glass windows. But the site where you had your photograph taken on Ellis Island is open to tourists marked by a photo booth. There is still one camera on Ellis Island and I'm sitting in front of it, I'll meet you here. I'm wearing a Humberg with a stiff brim and a suit just like yours. The tourists mistake me for a living exhibit, a reenactor. Who are you? They ask me, I tell them to guess. I came up on the train, two days spent on the rails you once rode the other way. This morning, I told my mother I was taking a ferry to Ellis Island. She said, we didn't come that way. It was Canal Street for us. I know. There's no one up there for you, she said, hanging up. But I haven't come looking for family. I've come to meet you, Lightning Man. As this is the lightning rod season, it is the opportune time to put the homeowner on his guard against the wiles of one lightning rod man, who is now going his rounds in the lower wards equipped with a reel of twisted white ribbon, some alleged insulators, a few gilded points and spikes, and an enormous quantity of impudent loquacity. From the Louisiana Electrical Review, January 30th, 1909. You protected us from fires. My mother invoked you when the weather turned, when hard rain shorted our window units, when jellyfish sucked up into Gulf Powers turbines fried the circuitry and we lived for days in the dark, when the generator at the corner of Lee and Empire blew, when the neighbor girl dropped her hair dryer into the kitchen sink and the surge protectors tripped one after another down the row of flats, my mother said, where's that lightning man? 
When a storm tracked off the Gulf to New Orleans, she didn't call on Jesus. She clasped her hands in front of the standing fan and she said, hear us, lightning man. We climbed into the bathtub, put the mattress there on top and hunched against it for breathing room. We listened to shingles pull away from the roof to the trees outside popping like cans to the Kesey family next door singing Hosanna crammed into their tub, same as us. We said, come on, lightning man, knock at our door, lightning man, keep us safe, lightning man, we're calling you. After, in the giddy, permissive days following any storm, I used bungee cords for jump ropes. I skipped with the other kids singing, lightning man, lightning man, where's your rod? We tapped Coast Guardsmen on the shoulder to whisper the question and ran, shrieking. We couldn't have said why it was funny, but we were certain it was. We made our own lightning rods. We lashed coat hangers to the gutter. We tied Christmas ornaments to brooms with butcher's twine and dangled them out windows. If the ornament twisted left, a storm was coming. If it twisted right, our mamas were. We all knew your story. We'd heard it from our mothers over dinners of macaroni eaten before the standing fans. The year was 1920. You appeared in a thunderstorm on the porch of the landlord's flat. You held a staff of iron from which hung a crystal ball, the sort used for divination. You knocked. The landlord mistook your knocking for thunder. Perhaps your knocking was thunder. You let the thunder do your knocking for you. You sold lightning rods, iron rods, a dollar a foot, the glass balls you'd throw in free. Four rods would cover the flats, protect them from lightning fires, 40 feet of iron, $40. The landlord refused. The landlord was warded, pimpled, bespectacled, every kind of ugly. The landlord was tight as a mule's ass with his money. One year later, the flats caught fire. Inside, 24 people, women and children, four rods would have covered the flats, $40. Most ended the story there with a suck of air through their teeth, one shake of the head. We may be stingy, but we aren't cheap. Not my mother, my mother went on. You died in 1932, she said. You were entombed in St. Louis Cemetery number three, east of New Orleans. The undertaker, when he stripped your body for embalming, discovered you had been all along a woman costumed with a man's suit and a smoker's cough, a Canadian with no US citizenship and no family to speak of. My mother liked your story because she thought it illustrated the progress made by women of her generation. These days, you wouldn't have to hide that way. You could sell a lightning rod wearing a skirt, might sell more. I liked your story because I suspected even then you weren't a woman or a man. You were a lightning man with a knock like thunder. I felt close to you. I'll stop there. That was terrific. <laughs> Yay, yeah, everybody clap, clap in the chat. Um, it is um, my pleasure to be here with you tonight. And it was a definite pleasure to hear you read from this book that I feel like I read long ago now, but have been thinking about um, ever since um, Jackson sent me uh, an early copy of it, a spiral bound copy of it. And I would sit, I would sit in bed and like read the stories and make such loud noises that my girlfriend asked me what was what was happening um it's um truly um a remarkable collection um and i have one million questions that i want to ask you about it um i want to remind everybody though that there is a q a button um i'm sure that you all have a million questions too so if you have a question anytime you're thinking about it just go ahead and pop down into the box and and put that question in there so at the end we can get to it and i won't take up the entire time asking my own questions. Um, but just to get started, um, I think a good question to ask that I'm always wondering about when it comes to short fiction collections in general is um, not just like the impulse behind creating a specific collection, though that's part of the question I want to ask, but about what the process was like, like how these stories knit together for you, if they started off as um, you know, it's like a germ of an idea with one story that kind of begat like the other stories? Or did you find that as you were writing stories that you found like a through line that kind of connected them and strung them together and what that looked like for you with Manywhere and how that was set up? Yeah, um, so I had written three of the stories, uh, Taylor Johnson's Lightning Man, The Expectation of Cooper Hill and Alta's Place uh, in sort of quick succession a few years back and realized as I was revising those stories and working with uh, friends to improve them that 
they were asking similar questions and had themes in common, um, themes of gender and sexuality, of uh, whiteness, of lineage and history. Uh, and I think centrally a theme of uh, like self mythologizing and the stories that we tell about ourselves and the people on whom we maybe model those stories or from whom we draw to tell those stories. And I think all three of the, of the stories uh, were interested in the ethics of that process. And we're asking questions about uh, what it looks like for different individuals. And I, so the story collection began there and I knew that I wanted it to feel like a gender expansive story collection. So I think that one of the things I was thinking about as I continued to write other stories that became uh, the, the nine stories in many where um, I was thinking about ensuring that a whole variety of lived experiences with regard to gender identity, especially were represented. Yeah, it's, um, there's so much happening in this collection that I, I found myself um, doing what I don't normally do when I read a short fiction collection. And normally, I normally do like read through and um, like I'll stop, like I don't read through like in totality, like I'll read one and pause and think about it. And then usually linearly go into the next one. I kind of found myself like I was so interested and intrigued by like how the stories like sat inside of the collection that I found myself flipping to different ones out of order. Um, and then I, cause this is a, a book that I have already read three times. Uh, I, I, then I went through and I was like, now I'm interested in reading it in order, but like it was doing so many of the things that you talked about. And I was like, this is so interesting to think about how they, how they touch each other even the ones that aren't touching each other physically in the book they the stories like are still feel like very deeply connected um so when you were in the process of like culling and combining into this book did you find that you took any out or the shape of it changed because i think shape is an interesting thing to think about too because um i mean this is a book that's very bodied so like what when you were th thinking about how it, they sat together like was there shape that you thought about like what was the revision process like for putting these stories together and and settling them into each other yeah um i think the central revelation of the process of actually creating the collection was that towards the end i had like seven stories and I was thinking about stories that I had written long ago um, that I had in a sort of story bank and whether any of those fit. Uh, and one of the stories that I had written during my MFA um, was an early draft of the story Transit that is now in the collection. And I had written that before I understood anything about myself as a gender queer person or as a queer person. Uh, and yet when I returned to that story, I saw so many elements of uh, of dysphoria and of um, like uh, like the way that for the like, gender queer identities and eating disorders can go together um, and all of these other things that I think were present in the story long before I understood them to be aspects of my own life um, and so that story ended up with some revision actually fitting into the final collection, which was something that I had not anticipated when I was originally writing the stories. And I think often I find that uh, my fiction is ahead of me when it comes to my own understandings of identity around like gender and sexuality. And that feels like an example of that too. Yeah, that, yeah, that feels deeply relatable to hear that. <laughs> I feel like constantly um, the fiction is ahead of myself as well in terms of anything I think. Like there's this like feeling, like not even necessarily in revision, but just in terms of writing and then looking at the work again and this kind of discovery of like, oh, is that what I was, is that what I mean? Or is like, is that like the idea? Or is that what I'm like, I'm really trying to get at? And I think that's like, can be like an exciting surprise, but also sometimes excruciating. <laughs> this like, oh, like, oh, and then, oh no, or, oh, okay. I guess that's what we're doing now. So that's like, that's interesting to hear. Cause I, I do think that that's like deeply relatable. Um, a, a story that I know that you're probably getting a million questions about also that's in this collection is a fucking blockbuster that was in the Atlantic. Um, 
just ridiculously good story that um, that I you were able to do a Q and A with about like for the Atlantic, um, which I was fascinated by because I found that story to be which is bump. Um, and if for those of you that haven't read it, it's um, I'm going to let Morgan talk about it. Um, the the story is I've never read anything like it before, and it was a story that I found deeply tender and moving, and also at points like would find myself kind of chuckling at something even though even if it wasn't supposed to be funny because I think like, there's just this like embedded wit that's there but I would love if you would talk some about bump to people because I think it's one of those stories where I was like I think I told this to Jackson I was like even if the rest of the stories in this collection hadn't been great which they are which is ridiculous like the other eight stories in this book are just like phenomenally good that story like reading it I was like this is incredible like I've, I've never read a story that was doing so much which is like I don't know I'm sounding very intelligent right now but I'd love if you would like just discuss the process of that specific story because I feel like or what your thought was behind um like like the germ of it like did were you did you have an image was it that like fake pregnancy bump that came to you first? Were you thinking about like conceptually the idea, like how that story like came to be, how that story was birthed, let's say that maybe. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so the original idea came from a conversation that I was having with friends uh, who were like cis and, and gender queer and trans. Um, and we were talking about how for so many of us with our many different gender identities, uh, the ways that pregnancy and childbirth are discussed currently in our culture can feel really painful um, and cause like several of us to feel different types of grief, either grief around uh, not wanting children and feeling as though one was supposed to want them or wa around wanting children and being unable to have them for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so I wrote Bump Centrally to explore um, that grief and also I think the ways that our current uh, language around yeah, pregnancy and childbirth can be exclusive of, of trans and gender queer people. Um, and I, as I was writing the story, it was one of the last, it was the last story that I wrote um, that made it into the collection of Manywhere. And so I think I was also in a place of wanting to think about uh, like joy and celebration, which I know it doesn't read as a particularly joyful or, celebrate, or a celebratory story necessarily, but I think that of all the narrators in many where Louis to me has the clearest sense of her own desires and moves towards them in a way that I think is actually fulfilling for her. And that felt to me itself really joyful and celebratory. Um, and there are so many things in that story from like um, Louis having like frank conversations about gender with her Nana to like um, even just uh, like Louis's like socioeconomic status that I think felt like uh, sort of like dreams that I was offering myself as a gender queer person um, and maybe also just trying to offer um, to the story collection as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I agree with you though. I think like I mean if we're thinking like like in terms of like plot development, like, I don't know, I get I'm thinking about like where like joy sits inside of things mm -hmm. sometimes is um, that's, I, I would agree with you on that. I think that there's this, there's this way in which like, right, like joy sits inside of this idea that like somebody who has a deeper understanding of like maybe what their own needs are and like fi and finding that out as a person who never <laughs> understands. <laughs> I was like, oh, that, I feel like that is like a kind of like a kind of joy. Um, you did an interview with Otto Straddle. I'm going to quote you. Uh, <laughs> you stated that like um, these like stories that you've written were all asking about lineage, about gender and sexuality, and about how we create our own self mythologies. Which I love that. And I wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about the idea of like the mythology of the style of the self, because I think that that that's always a very exciting idea in fiction, because um, we're already as authors trying to sit and like write, like kind of create these worlds, these things that exist inside of, sometimes I think of it as like the snow globe, right? Like the cotton mm -hmm. of time and how it exists in there. But these like inset, inset stories or these kind of mythologies like exist also inside of these. And the stories in this collection do this incredible job of creating their own mythologies or like 
developing them in these in a myriad different ways and I'd love if you if you talk about that a little bit more yeah um so I think the seed of that really came from Frank Woodhull uh the story that I read from the first story in the collection and I found myself uh several years ago just really interested in fascinated by Frank Woodhull. It like bordered on a sort of obsession. I felt some sort of kinship, some sort of draw with Frank Woodhull. I was like reading everything that I could, all these old newspaper articles and finding mentions of Frank in uh, like dissertations. And I became interested in my own obsession uh, and skeptical of it, I think. Uh, and I wondered if like, if I could actually claim some sort of kinship or lineage with Frank Woodhull, what are the potential effects of claiming that um, kinship or lineage? And so, as I usually do as a writer, if I am feeling uh, like I want to write a story and I'm also feeling unsure of the ethics of the story or feeling like ethical questions are sort of centered in the story, I just, I tend to put those questions on the page as best I can so that then I can distance myself from them and can look at them and, uh, and think through them in the story itself. And so I think that the central way that I'm seeing like self mythology present in the stories of many where structurally is that often the stories are looking at uh, a sort of a, a character, I guess I could say like a secondary character that I'm not sure if that's quite fair, but they're looking at a character like Frank Woodhull through the lens of another character like Taylor Johnson. Uh, and then I, the author, I'm like, and, and like looking at Taylor Johnson, but of course there are also aspects of myself in Taylor Johnson. Um, and so there's this layering effect where like Taylor is creating a Frank Woodhull who is not real and is also like, like drawing in some ways from um, historical documents. And then like the implied author is like creating this character of Taylor Johnson who is creating this character of Frank Woodhull. And so there's all these layerings of story making and mythology. Um, and I think it's like actually that layering effect that I was centrally interested in as I was writing many of the stories of Manywhere. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's very present, but it's in this way that is like, feels like as you're reading or for myself as a reader, like peeling back in this very interesting way that does what I'm so interested in in fiction all the time, which is not answering a question, but asking a question to like get to a better way to ask a question <laughs> maybe. Um, and so I, I, I love that because I do think like, because also so much of like who we are as people is built upon like the ways in which we see ourselves and see other people and think about the ways that other people see us and then how those things are very disparate. Like, and if you layered them over each other, it'd be this very, this blurring kind of thing that happens. Um, but mentioning history, there's a ton of historical work that's gone into this collection. Um, and I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm a librarian also. So <laughs> was, like, the research aspect of it was deeply fascinating to me. Um, but there's many stories in this collection that touch upon different kind of like historical things that are going on. And I'd love to hear about your process for not only like discovering that or just discover like you've already talked about like right the kind of the obsessive quality becoming interested in something um but if if it was all like that with those different kind of historical things how you incorporated them into the fiction and what the research process was like for you as you did that yeah um the research process was I think disorganized and chaotic um I often like had to go back and uh, find citations for quotes or blocks of text that I had drawn and then had not like written down where I had uh, drawn them from. But I think um, I think that that was the most like that was the one of the central joys of writing this book uh, was seeking different historical figures and also the fact that once uh, people in my communities knew that I was writing this book, I was often like offered historical figures that other people had encountered who had been significant to them for for some variety of reason. And so understanding that others were also seeking this sort of historical lineage and finding it um, was a real central joy. And I think uh, that I would often just follow a trail of research until I found something that sparked like interest uh, or a sense, yeah, a sense of like connection for me. Um, I remember finding the, the trial transcripts of Thomasine Hall, which inspired the story, The Daring Life of Philippa Cook there again. Uh, just 
looking at this transcript uh, from 1629 and understanding that this person had like stood up before court uh, and said like, I am both a man and a woman and had talked openly about like sex and sexuality in a court in 1629. Like there's something about that that I think just really sparked interest and joy in me. And so many of the stories were written just in following that, following that interest, um, following those historical pieces and then trying to imagine into the gaps in history, right? The fact that after that trial transcript, I know nothing about the life of Thomasine Hall. Um, it didn't write the life of Thomasine Hall, but wrote a sort of adjacent life for a genderqueer person potentially right. in, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I mean, this is a book that obvious, quite obviously is like investigating like these kind of mythologies and like how gender could like sit with them or like could not, or like the kind of like obscuring of that. And it's like, right, like the idea of like you as a, as a writer are like just making the decisions in this moment, right? To like, this, this is how the story will be. And this is how like gender will function inside of this specific kind of re not retelling, but like kind of telling of it. Um, and it's, it's so much a book. I mean, I love um, any, I love fiction and bodies. I love bodies and fiction because bodies are so unruly. Um, mm -hmm. they, all, like they do all these kinds of things, like the, the kind of physical mess of bodies, but also the things they can do and, and what, and how they function in fiction is like exciting to me. And it's, uh, it, you have a story in which I, it's, you know, your surrogate story, where it's like, it's thinking about bodies, like inside a body, right? Like the idea of a, a human body holding another body inside of it. But then there's also, I don't think this is a spoiler, but like the idea of like a, a car where that is parked, mm -hmm. where there's someone in the trunk of the car, um, kind of like inside of it, like the body of the car. And I was, it was like a moment of, as a writer myself was like, I was so mad. I was like, this is so good. <laughs> this, I like, right, like, you know, like you like, are, I was like, oh, this is like such a good kind of thinking about like how bodies hold bodies and like how bodies are held. Um, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I, I would love if you would talk about like how you thought about bodies as you approached the stories. And I, I don't know if they were, if it was like different for each one or if, if it shifted over time as you were, as you were working on this project. I mean, I think our ideas and thoughts about things like that shift constantly just on a, maybe on a minute to minute basis, but what that looked like for you specifically in, in many where, like how, how bodies the bodies sat inside of you and how you sat them inside of the stories. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I owe a real debt here to the gender queer and to spirit and trans authors who have come before me um, and who have who have written into these stories before me. Um, I'm thinking here about the work of Akwikia Mezi. I'm thinking especially about River Solomon's and Unkindness of Ghosts, which was really formative for me in the way that I thought about bodies uh, and T. Fleischman and um, Joshua Whitehead and Billy Ray Belcourt's incredible recent memoir. Because when I first started to write these stories, I was fully unable to embody my characters on the page. I really struggled with it. I remember trying to revise Alta's place um, with uh, the incredible editors at Electric Lit and having uh, comments from the editor of like, can we just like understand the, the physicality of this character and putting down like description after description and then like deleting them because everything felt gendered. Like everything felt like it connoted gender one way or another. And I think one of the things that uh, I was thinking a lot about as I wrote these stories was uh, treading carefully where gender was concerned for my narrators and especially for historical figures. Um, so I really, really struggled early on. And I think it was only through reading these other gender queer writers that I um, began to be able to actually like render the characters in embodied ways on the page um, and to, to find ways to think about uh, body and gender together within um, the written language. And I think that Something I just uh, was thinking about recently was uh, I was uh, talking about Manywhere with a friend and um, they had asked if, they, if I thought I would like keep writing into the same questions. And I had sort of said something along the lines of like, no, I think I've like figured out 
the questions of like identity and the body and like those are the many more questions and I'll let them rest and now I want to ask like questions about how we relate to each other and like different questions and then the other day I was reading something that talked about uh just the way that those two things are commingled like it was specifically talking about the way that um, evolution selects potentially for like relationships between organisms and assemblages of organisms and these historical relationships and not for an individual body but essentially it was just like I understood that there's no way of pulling those two questions apart or right? like I can't be like nope done I'm done with the body and now I'm just gonna like write about uh write about relationships um and so so I think that it's uh, it remains a live question for me and something that I'm still figuring out how to put on the page. Um, but I feel really indebted to the authors who have like, shown me a way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I first of all, I love that because I think that that's something too. Like, don't we always like? I like. I feel like when we think we've figured out what we need to know about something, and that is when the bottom falls out, and we understand that those things are like, oh, this is, there's like a whole new level that I didn't understand that these things are connected, and I, I still have other questions that are connected to it. Like, maybe we, when we run out of questions in that kind of way, then we're dead. <laughs> I don't know, uh, as bleak as that sounds, but um, speaking of uh, Alta's Place, I'm going to read you your own work back to you again, which is <laughs> my favorite thing to do. Um, but there's a line in that that I, I was like, I want to talk about it because I think it kind of goes back to like how you were saying, like in, in the editing process about like how to, how to, body a person there's this part where after the narrator like identifies herself as a lesbian she says like identifying in part because I suspected it was true and in part because it was my habit then to remember what had been said and reflect it back to the speaker as if it were an invention of my own um along with that being just like an incredible like line like an incredible like sentence um to have written um there's this way in which like it incorporates like this idea of like mythologizing right like we were talking about like the person but also this kind of like as we grow and learn about ourselves as people this kind of way that we learn to do that by being like a reflection of the things that the, that people put towards us um mm -hmm. and I loved seeing that in there so it was it it was interesting to hear you talk about like what that process had been like in terms of revision um, because that story to me, that specific story is so bodied um, that I was like, it's, it's like fascinating to hear like what the process was like for you. Um, but that, yeah, that line, like the idea of like the kind of reflection, like were you thinking about like the, the body kind of thing when you did that or like the mythology? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think again, it's a story where we're seeing someone like seek to understand their own identity through another person and I think in Alta's place it's especially freighted right by the fact of the narrator's whiteness and the sort of exoticization of Alta that's happening within the story even as the narrator is also trying to understand uh like sexuality and modeling that sexuality off of Alta um in certain ways and I think I mean I think this is where my interest in the ethics of uh, like of models and of self mythologies that are based on others um, comes into play because I think if we aren't especially careful about um, the ways that our identities and our understandings of ourselves are built by like reflecting and building off of the identities of others, it can easily be appropriative, right? It could easily be actually actively harmful. Um, and so I think that, that those are some of the things that I was thinking about as I was writing Alta's Place. It's beautiful. I mean, that's like a, I mean, there's a million sentences of your own I could read back to you. I won't do that. I won't do that. We would run out of time. Um, <laughs> another thing that um, as a person who's very interested um, in writing about place and by writing about place, I think what I mean is trying to figure out the right way to think about place or maybe not the right way, like figuring out how to and re-figuring out how to. I was fascinated by your Lit Hub piece, um, your essay on um, place writing and the idea of like reframing and not thinking about place as character, right? Like the idea that like place is dynamic um, and place is like the movement of things. Um, I 
first of all, like I am so interested and I think I could spend an hour asking you questions about this idea. And I, I hope if you don't mind, if you would talk a little bit, like not only about how you thought about that inside of these specific stories in many where, but in how you think about place in terms of like fiction and essay work and how we sit with it and, and just in general and, and kinds of writing, because I, I love this idea of, of place as, as not like a static thing, right? Like this idea of like places movement is like kind of as a dynamic thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, place is, is sentient, right? And dynamic and living uh, and is also historical, right? Like is itself a, uh, uh, an accumulation of historical processes and of current processes, and those are geologic and ecological uh, and human mediated and also non human. Um, and so I think it's just uh, this incredible intersection of processes. Uh, and I'm trying to think about how to sort of um, like focus the answer. And I think that maybe one way to do that that is personal um, would be to think about like gender and the way that I think about gender identity as being connected to place. Um, and this is something I've been thinking about recently and I feel like my thoughts are half formed, but I just, I was realizing that when I returned to um, the South really recently, I had been feeling uh, like a gender queer person really like firm and affirmed in that identity in Oregon. Um, and I got here and I felt uh, this interesting like shift in my own understanding of, um, of gender. I think in part just because it was a little bit harder in um, here to uh, find space for like they them pronouns and for a sort of gender queer identity. And I started to think about like transmasculinity in a way that I hadn't really been thinking about it in Oregon. Um, and when I consider that shift in myself, I think what it makes me think about is the ways in which, like even if we think about gender queerness, uh, gender queerness itself, like across um, what we now call the United States is not a monolithic identity, right? But is itself informed by, by place in this sort of patchwork and regal, regional and localized way. Um, so I, I wonder like if I had grown up all my life in, um, like if I just stayed, if I had stayed in Northwest Florida for all my life, how would my understanding of gender be different because of all these different intersections of place in Northwest Florida, including like the histories there um, and the current processes there, then my gender identity is having like traveled to Oregon. Um, and I think of it in the story Transit, especially where I think we see blue, uh, like understanding, themselves as like a girl who could be whatever, right? Um, and I wonder like if Blue's understanding of gender would be different if they were uh, like in a different place. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think I know the answers to any of these questions, but I think when I think about place, I'm understanding it as deeply formative in that way, like deeply formative of, again, the ways that we mythologize and understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great answer, but I also, I do think it's like something, right? Where it's like, I think the half formed answer is gonna <laughs> continually be like the right way to think about um, um, how we approach any kind of understanding of like how a body fits inside of a place that is, because I think there's this way in which like, right? Like to, to write places character is to, is to, like when I, if, when I have done that myself, like when I have thought that way is to put my own personalized, like, right, kind of like very like colonizer kind of like viewpoint and like very white cis kind of viewpoint into like, here's how this place functions in terms of how I have processed it. Um, and to think about the many layers in which like other people have experienced that same kind of place in those different kinds of ways has this like, layering effect as, aside from the idea of place as this kind of moving breathing Florida specifically talking about Florida I'm in Miami right now so the idea of like the erosion of place or how places is, is different on its own from like from interference but also just from like shifting and how how it's like not a static thing so yeah I think the half-formed thought on that is is 
the is the the approach it sounds like it, it resonates with me as a person who definitely doesn't understand um like how a place functions and this feels like continually engaging with it but i i, yeah. I strongly urge our listeners to check out that LitHub piece. It came out today, I think. Um, it's really, really good. Um, it made me have a lot of questions, which always makes me like excited. <laughs> it, it makes me think, I'll just say, um, there's this really incredible, there's a book that's sitting up on the top of my bookshelf there, um, Fresh Banana Leaves, and I have not finished reading it, but I was just um, reading an essay by um, the author, uh, Tess Hernandez, and, um, the essay talked about the ways that like invasive plant species in sort of white colonial uh, approaches to conservation are often uh, seen as like, like they're like called evil and they're like, we need to like get rid of them all and like get rid of them in any way possible. And um, the author who is indigenous was talking about the fact that like for colonizers, for settlers, these plants are the plants that like often we brought them over, right? So they are actually, if we think all the way back to history, potentially like our plant relatives. Um, and, and there's this like separation that happens uh, between like body and place such that these plants then are like demonized and um, understood to be, understood to be like wholly bad and not, um, but that the historical aspects of that relationship are being ignored, I think, which is also part of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think when we are thinking with uh, a settler colonial mindset about what place is. Yeah, I have to read that. Um, <laughs> that's like very, I don't know, it's very exciting. Um, I know I need to ask the questions from the audience, but I'm gonna ask like one more quick one just because um, uh, I get to, I'm in charge right now. But uh, I was hoping you would talk uh, a little, I mean, you mentioned uh, in transit, uh, like the transit story, um, which was a story that did this like very fascinating thing to me. Cause I am a person who likes to look and see how like humor can sit inside of fiction, especially alongside stuff that um, is asking us to experience like a bevy of other kind of simultaneously emotions like right this is like a character who is dealing with like the uh, eating disorder is dealing with like um lots of other different kinds of things and they're like right like stuck in this kind of like they are in transit together and stuck in this place and the idea that there's this this like kind of mistaken identity where the woman thinks that this person is a vampire um was so fascinating to me but also like deeply funny to me on this level. And I was wondering, I don't know if you thought at all about um, how humor sits inside of these, but maybe you definitely did. But like, I would love to, if you could talk a little bit about like how you thought about how, because I read those human emotions all kind of sit and mix together anyway, right? But like how you thought about that when you were writing these stories, specifically that one. Mm. Yeah, again, I think that that, I think that humor and joy are important to me uh, because I want to represent a complex range of emotions in my stories and because it feels important to insist upon like queer and gender queer people having lives that include humor and joy um, and to, to sort of push back sometimes on statistics around like mental health and, um, and other correlations, which while important are not the whole story of queer and gender queer identities. Um, so I think that's one part. And then I think within that story, what I liked when I returned to it, again, I like went back to it as I was putting this collection together. And one of the things that I realized as I reread it was that uh, it feels so sort of silly, like ridiculous, right? To assume based on what someone's wearing and how they look that they're a vampire, right? Like, and there are, there are many reasons for that, myriad reasons for that. And I don't want to say that it is the same, um, but I was just, I was, I was thinking as I was rereading it, um, this is early on in my like experiments with um, with different gender presentations, and I was thinking about how there are like parallels with the sort of um, like with the ways that our gender is is assumed and presumed based on like what we're wearing or how we look, right? And um, and how often that can be at a real mismatch with like internal understandings of identity. And so I think some of the humor for me in that story comes from that connection. Yeah. That's, I love that so much. Okay, I have to 
I have to ask the questions out. If anybody um, in the audience still has more questions, I know we have a couple in here, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A. Um, uh, and uh, I'll try and find them if they're in the chat, but if you can just put them in that little Q&A box. But um, I'll go ahead and ask this first one that's here. As a trans writer, I find myself struggling to talk about gender in a way that is expansive and honest because I'm scared that readers will take any ambiguity or confusion as a license to hold tighter to their bigotry. Do you have a similar experience or tips on how to write about gender in a radical or fun way without shrinking in terror that your work is going to make things worse for trans people? Mm, that's a beautiful question. Um, I think about this a lot. I think that. Uh, I think here again, I feel a lot of gratitude for um, the people that I mentioned earlier, River Solomon and Akwiki Amisi, and um, I don't know if I mentioned Joshua Whitehead and Abby May Otis, but those also for like all of these different uh, two-spirit and trans and genderqueer writers who are um, creating space in the literary world for many different representations of um, genderqueer lived experience. And so I think that I feel really lucky that I, I don't I don't feel like I am uh, that I have like a responsibility of representing like genderqueer people as a monolith. Um, and I, I think understanding my own uh, like understanding that I'm part of that conversation is really comforting to me when I'm thinking about this question. And I think that the other thing that I would say in response to it is that uh, it feels uh, to me as though there is a way of like, uh, that we can circumscribe ourselves, right? If we are afraid of the stereotypes and um, narratives that we, have like inherited from a cis normative world. And so it feels like writing with awareness of those, but maybe not in fear of those is the is the path that I have found um, like forward through uh, like when writing about trans and gender queer lived experiences. I don't think I have an answer to the question, but those are some of the ways that I try to think about it. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that sounds great. Um, okay. My students and I discussed bump in our literature class yesterday, and one topic that came up was the decision to end the story at the place it concluded before Louis has to make the decision about her bump. Could you talk about the decision to end bump where you did, and potentially how you decide when in time and plot to end a story? P.S. The students are all here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. Uh, so I think that for me, by the end of Bump, uh, like my understanding is that Louis' sort of predicted ending is the is the real ending. That the grief of that predicted ending is what will occur in the future. Um, and so I wasn't attempting to leave it ambiguous in precisely that way. But I think that more broadly. When I consider the endings of stories, often I think, actually, Kristen, I think you said this earlier about um, a character sort of getting to a new question, a different question. And I think I often am seeking a, a question for the character that allows them uh, like to take action and or to feel a sort of sense of things coming to a close. And so I think in Bump, the way that I was understanding the structure is that um, Louis is revising, so there's a sort of question that, that Louis cannot answer, that I can't answer, that no one can answer, right? Which is like, what makes an experience of gender real? Um, and then I think within that question, I see Louis searching for and revising towards a better question, which is within like our current constructions and frameworks around gender and circumscribed by those, like what are my desires and how can I move towards them? And so when you see Louis like get to that question, um, and act on it and an experience. And that's the sort of like the joy and the celebration, right? Is the experience of actually um, being able to embody pregnancy or this, this uh, experience adjacent to pregnancy as Louis puts it in the story. Um, and then I think we see that like come to, to a close at the end of the story. Um, and we understand that like there's been a, um, like Louis has moved through that uh, and then we see the the grief of that ending. That's a, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's like one of those things too, where it's like a, 
um, deciding when in time and plot to end a story is feels like one of those things like maybe we were talking about earlier where it's like that this the, it kind of happens before you you decide like you're like the the natural like progression of like where the story ends like or what happens with inside of a story kind of you're running along after it maybe sometimes uh but uh I love that everybody is here to hear your answer for that <laughs> class listening and waiting for you to do that um, yeah thanks for coming <laughs> um did creating all this multi-dimensionality for these characters allow you to own more of your own dimensions oh uh that's my friend itai thank you for that question um yeah absolutely i mean i think as i said at the beginning my fiction always feels like it's out ahead of me when it comes to understandings of gender and uh, and sexuality and really just under understandings of myself in general. Uh, and so when I first began writing this collection, I didn't use the word genderqueer. I didn't use they, them pronouns. Uh, I was just starting to think of myself as queer. And so I think these stories were in a way uh, a large part of that journey towards self-understanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have one more in here. Um, how do you know when a story has ended, given that the stories often end on a note of ambiguity? <laughs> yeah. I think it's really hard to know. Um, that's like, I mean, you have talked a little bit, just go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm just like, ooh. <laughs> yeah, this again is, I think that sense of revising towards a better question. I think that when my narrator has found a question that allows them to take action and to move towards desire, uh, and or to move resolutely away from a specific desire. I feel like that sort of, of shift, that change, that ability on the part of a character to have agency and to take action usually signals for me the end of, of a story. Mm -hmm. um, I had some other questions. I hope you were <laughs> ending on them very quickly. Um, but um, I, you talked a little bit about this, but I'm always really intrigued, especially with short fiction collections, like what work um, informed like the like you as you were working, like where there's like specific books, um, like of nonfiction, of essay work, of poetry, because I find poetry really deeply informs like a lot of um, things that I'm writing on in ways that maybe fiction sometimes doesn't when I'm writing fiction. But if there was like specific works as you were the process of writing these individual stories as you were coming to revising them as you were coming to like putting the collection like putting the puzzle pieces together to put the collection together if there was work that like specifically resonated with you as you were doing that yeah um i feel like i've i've mentioned the the authors who laid the foundation enough so i think i'll i'll, I'll think with this question more about craft and structure um and say that the people who made many rare possible by offering me frameworks for the stories and structures for the stories would be um, Julia Otsuka, The Buddha in the Attic, um, the like accumulative effect of the collective voice in that story um, was a real inspiration for that drowning place. Um, uh, Kelly Link's speculative fiction and speculative elements, uh, I think were really important, especially for the stories on um, the expectation of Cooper Hill and Manywhere. Um, and then for structure, always Alice Monroe, I think I often draft off of, um, off of her structures and stories. And I feel like I learned structure from reading those short stories. Yeah. I was, I think, I was like, I feel like when I think about like, like structure and short fiction, I think a lot about Alice Monroe that, that resonates with me a lot. Um, we have another one in the, um, in the Q&A box. I'm going to ask you that one. Um, there's lots of important water and fire in these pieces. Forgive me for being woo woo, but could you talk about these elements as they pop up in your work or how you think of the natural world and forces? Yes, thank you, CJ, for this question. Um, I think this goes back a little bit to place, and I think that 
one example that is maybe illustrative of how I'm, I think about these things that I'm writing um, is that drowning place, which I just mentioned, um, like the Buddha in the attic as an inspiration for the structure there and the collective voice. I also think that one of the reasons that that story found the structure that it did is because I was thinking about uh, like climate change, I was thinking like the global weirding and the, um, the rising sea levels and the floods and the way that all of this can feel like a sense of like inundation, overwhelm, accumulation. And so as I wrote the story and found this sort of listing collective voice where we were accumulating objects and people and houses, uh, that felt like a way of trying to embody um, like water, this like rising water, these storms on the page structurally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, yes, those those forces are always present in the stories. Um, and that's just one example of a way that they have found themselves into the work. Um, I, I was very much enjoyed the idea of like, a, I, that was something that was like an, one of my many questions that I, I was like, I have too many, but um, I love the idea. Like there's like this kind of perspective idea in many of the different stories, but not only that, like you have like a lot of, like you have some that are like a you, and then there's like the they, we, and then there's, um, there's a fascinating way in which you like work in like, um, like epistolary, right? Like with like the letters that are inset in there or even emails. Um, and I, from a craft perspective, um, which I know not everybody wants to talk about all the time, I was fascinated by, and like, if you could talk about like even a little bit, I know we have like a couple couple minutes, but like um, how you how you considered what what kind of things you wanted to put in there like that, because it is a book that does like historical things, or you're doing like the idea of like research or like reaching out like through time. Um, and I don't know, like, I don't know if you were thinking about that in terms of like the letter writing or how things are like worded or like spoken in that kind of way. Yeah, a lot of that was was like fancy footwork to try to be sensitive to gender identity and also to uh, and also to again focus on like these ethical questions of story making and not on like truth, right? So I think for instance the letters are uh, like almost certainly forgeries, almost certainly fakes. Um, and that plays in then to the sense of like, what does it mean to be building a foundation of oneself on um, like a life that we're understanding through in part these letters, which also the narrator understands probably not to be true. And that that, that truth or non-truth of the letters has less, uh, is like less important finally than the the possibilities that they offer for sort of self narrative and self understanding. Um, and for instance, the like the use of you in the story about Frank Woodhull was a way of not having to use any gendered pronouns for Frank Woodhull, right? Not having to actually say anything about Frank Woodhull's gender because I I don't think I know. I don't think I'll ever be able to know um, how Frank Woodhull understood gender identity. And so often these like structural aspects were tricks to ensure that I was treading lightly when it came especially to queer and gender queer figures in history. I think we have run out of time. I have, I will just like email you the <laughs> of my million questions that I have left. Um, but uh, I, um, Oh, hey, sorry. I was like, I was like, don't leave me. I was like, I will just keep this going. We'll keep going for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, thank you both so much for joining us and for all the great conversation and all that. Uh, we appreciate having you here with us. Um, everyone go out there. There's the book. Go get a copy of this. Uh, I put links in pals.com. Yeah, right there. Awesome. So, um, so check that out. And uh, while you're on Palace.com, check out our upcoming virtual events that we have on there. And yeah, we look forward to uh, seeing you all at another event soon. So thank you both so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. It was great. <laughs> all right. Well, have a good night, everyone. Bye.